It's good to see you this morning. We are in a series called Different, Different, and what we understand about that is this. Our faith in Christ makes us different. And so what we have shaped around this was we uh, looked, we started this series last Sunday, and we talked about that. And, and we're going through the book of 1 Peter, and in this book, and the, one of the first things he talks about was our new birth. And that new birth is our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And so as we come to that experience, that alone makes us different. That alone is a change in our lives. And so as we process our lives now as believers, what we find is that there is a, um, there's a, there's a difference between us and the issues around us. And there's not going to be necessarily, necessarily a negotiation between the two. It's just that we're gonna be different. And so what happens with this whole thing is Peter begins to explain to us, you know, last week we said, you know, the new birth causes us to be different. That's how we're different. Uh, I mean, that, that's why we're different because of that. But we want to look at some of the ways that how we're different and, and what happens in our, in our existence, what happens in the world around us. Because what, what I think is, is, is good, what, the, what I think is a positive thing, is that we receive and accept this difference as a calling. That God has done some things in our lives through faith in Christ that causes us to be different. Now, how do we manage that? How do we process that? You know? Because there's a lot of ways, a lot of different ways you could process your differences. You can make them adversarial, or you can make them an expression of balance. When Tammy and I got married, and by the way, we're, we'll be celebrating in about two weeks, we'll be celebrating 42 years of marriage, and uh, yeah, that could, go ahead. That, that's all for her, we know that, that's all for her. But uh, what, what we understand, what we found out about that is our differences actually balance us. I'm kind of an edgy person. I like, I like scary stuff. I like, you know, that kind of, she's, a, she's a very safe person. And so what's happened with that is I've kind of affected her to where she kind of comes my way a little bit, not much. I mean, I like to, you know, go scuba diving in caves. I like to get on a motorcycle, go 110 miles an hour. I, I mean, that's just how I'm wired. I like that kind of stuff. She does not like that kind of stuff. She gets on the motorcycle with me and she doesn't look at anything other than the speedometer. And she's got me like this, and I can tell when I've hit 60 miles an hour because I can't breathe. You know, and as I slow down, she kind of lets go a little bit. She, that's how she is. But what we found out is that, that that's not a conflict for us. It's a great balance for us. And so it's been a great part of our lives and raising children and, 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 and influencing our grandchildren and all those kinds of things because there's times that, you know, she has to kind of reel me in a little bit. And there's times that I kind of pull her out there a little bit. And, and it's just a, it's a good balance. And I think what we have to understand about that is that that's always going to be the situation. Because in our experience as believers, we're just going to be different. And that's not, uh, that's not a bad thing. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to pick up kind of where we left off last week. And I want to identify some of the things that... Um, that Peter talks about here as to why, as, as to how we're going to be different and how we need to look at this process. He talks about salvation. We looked at that in the, in the first uh, few verses last week. We talked about receiving Christ our Savior. And then he talks about, in verse number 10, concerning the salvation, the prophets spoke of the grace, and they looked into this. And they, the prophets of God in the Old Testament looked into this from what they understood about the coming of the Lord and his coming and, and, and providing uh, um, forgiveness for us for the death on, his, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, and all those kinds of things. And it talks about that until it gets down to verse number 13. And then in verse number 13, it says something that's really, really important. But let me just tell you this before I tell you that. When Peter was writing, he was writing to a group of people in a region which is kind of known as 
modern-day Turkey, but it was a region of uh, northern Asia Minor at that time. And these people were being persecuted because of their faith. I mean, they were being persecuted to the point that they couldn't make a living. They were being persecuted to the point that they, it was hard for them to even function. And, and, and this, was, this, is, this is the context in which Peter's writing to them. And what he's wanting to do is he's trying to encourage them, but he's also trying to instruct them in their faith. Because, folks, I want you to understand something. As we, as we come to faith in Christ and we live our lives, there's challenges that we're going to face because of our faith. Now, we don't know it so much in this land that we live in, uh, but it may be coming. Uh, the challenges may be coming more and more all the time. But these people were, were being severely persecuted. And what I shared with, them last, uh, with the folks last week was this, as, uh, as this was right around the time that Nero... Uh, arranged the fire in Rome and uh, did great damage. And then what he did was, uh, and as we know, he was probably responsible for that fire. All the damage it did, what he did was he lit Rome on fire and blamed it on the Christians. And so now the Christians came under great persecution and, and uh, great difficulty. And so what he's doing now is he's writing to them to encourage them. We already saw it in the, in the passage last week when he said, hey, listen, you know what? This great gift that God's given to you in salvation is a wonderful thing, but you're going to have to suffer for a little while. Folks, here's what I want you to understand. When, it, when you read the scripture and you talk about a life of faith, there's challenges with that. There's, a, there's, some, there's, some, uh, there's some suffering along the way. And I think it's important that we kind of feed that into the process and understand it up, uh, up front. Because what happens is we kind of think, okay, I'm going to serve God and everything's going to be great. Well, everything is going to be great, but it doesn't mean we're not going to be challenged. And so what he does is, is he, he moves on in verse number 13, and this is what he says. Listen. He said, therefore, with minds that are alert fully, uh, uh, and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed at his coming. Now listen to what, what he's telling them. He said, I want you to set your hope. I want you to set your hope on something. I want you to set your hope on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, the message of the gospel is he came, he died on the cross, he gave his life for us so that we could be forgiven. He rose from the grave, and the Bible says he's coming back. Now, in, in my experience and in my life, and in my dialogue and communication with uh, the people in my life, we all know this, we all believe this, so we share this. Have you ever woke up one morning and just knowing what you're going to face that morning, have you ever just looked up and said, Lord, if you want to come back right now, that's fine with me. Before I have to face this day, before I have to take this test, before I have to, you know, do all these, Lord, you just come on back. And so... What, what Peter's saying is pretty much the same thing. He, guys, he said, guys, set your hope on the coming of the Lord. Set your hope on that promise that he's given to us. And folks, let me just say this. Hope is a, is a forward version of faith. We have faith in God for what he's done in our life. And so what, what we could do is we live our life seeing God's faithfulness. And we look back on experiences and we say, well, God brought me through that. And so now I can trust him to bring me through whatever's coming, and, and we, we do that. You know what hope is? Hope is faith in the future. We can look out and go, you know what? I don't know what's out there, but I don't need to know. God's going to see me through it. He's brought me this far. He's going to see me through it. And hope is a, ter a tremendous virtue in our processes. You know how you can kind of <clears throat> evaluate yourself? In, 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 in some healthy ways of processing life is consider the things that you think about and do you think more about the past than you do the future? Do you think more about the present than the past? You say, well, pastor, you know what? It just seems like a lot of my thought processes and a lot of times when I'm just, you know, just maybe dozing off to sleep, or maybe just driving down the road, a lot of my thought processes are dedicated to the past. 
And folks, um, can I just tell you that that is a less healthy process than processing the present and the future. God's made us to be future people, you know. I made a statement last week. God's interested in your future. He said, I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope and a future. <laughs> I made the statement last week. God's not doing background checks on people. I had a guy walk up to me at the church I was over with. He said, man, I'm sure glad you said that. <laughs> God wants to give you a hope and a future. So we're, we're a people of hope. So he goes on in that passage of scripture and he talks, about, he talks about their hope and he's trying to encourage them with their challenges that they're having. And he says this in verse 14, as obedient children do, uh, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And then he says this, watch this. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. You know why we're different? We're holy. We're holy. You say, I am pastor, I think I stepped into the wrong church this morning. I don't think that's me. Let me show you something. Over in the book of Ephesians, chapter number one, verse number four, he opens this great book to these, talking to these people, and this is what he said about them. He said, for he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless, watch these words, in his sight. In his sight. And so what I want you to understand is the word holy is the Greek word that just means to set apart for special use or sacred use. That's what holy is. And so what God has done is he's called us to him and he wants us to be holy like he's holy. He is set apart. And he's, uh, and he's not, some people say, well, I can see God in creation. I understand what they're saying. But the truth of it is he created creation, but he stands alone as God. And so what we have to understand is that in that context, God has made us holy, according to Ephesians 1.4, and in that holiness, we are holy in his sight. And so what I'm telling you is this. He has set us apart for his service. And folks, let me tell you this. This makes us different. It makes us different. It makes us different in the system that we function in. It makes us different in the world that we live in. And so this is just how it's going to be. And as we pursue this more and more, then we see a greater difference moving forward. So in verse number 17, he goes on to say this. Um, he says, he's, well, before I say that, let me, let me explain to you um, two other aspects of holiness. Holiness has to do with being set apart. How you set something, you separate it from everything else because it's special. And what you find in the scripture is that the things that God called holy had a special use, had a very special use, a specific use. And I want you to understand that you fall in that category. They also had a specific value. Now, if you, you know, you may have something that's very valuable to you. But if you were to take it and have it at value assessed by an expert, it may not be that valuable, you know. I mean, I had, I was, um, years ago, I saw a, um, an old pickup truck on the side of the road, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to check that out. And I talked to the guy that had it, and I was going to buy it from him. And he said, well, he said, I, I need this much for it. And I said, well, that's really not worth that much. Can we, can we, can we negotiate? And, and he said, well, I, I think it's worth this much. I said, well, I'm willing to pay you this much. You got a better deal? No. He said, well, I, I guess I better take that. I said, that's what I'm thinking. He said, but this is a valuable truck. And he said, and I want you to know that my dog had her puppies in the back of that truck. <laughs> now, I don't know if that brings the price up or down. I'm not, I'm not for sure exactly how that works. But I think sometimes what we have to understand, if, the, if God values something, 
it's valued. That brings that that we can understand that. And there's going to be things that God values that other people don't value. There's going to be things God values that the world around us does not value. And I think it's important we understand that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the and of course the scripture also talks about the purification of of holiness. Uh, what what we what we understand is that which is holy needs to remain holy. And, and it needs to not be uh, contaminated or it needs to not be um, unholy in any way. Remember what Jesus said. He said, don't give what's holy to the dogs. Keep its holiness. Keep it purified. We'll talk about that too. So in this passage of scripture, he goes on to say in verse number, he talks about how to be holy. He, he talks about this holiness and he talks about how to be holy in a, in a, um, in a practical way. And he goes on in verse number 17 to say, since you were called, uh, since you call on the fa a father who judges each person's works impartially, then he says this, listen, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You hear what he said? Live out your time as foreigners here. Now, these people were here being persecuted. These people were people of faith, and he tells them to consider themselves as foreigners. Now, I think that's a really important concept as it's talking about being set apart for a particular use. Um, in, in this passage of Scripture, just in the book of Peter, remember when, we go, we, when uh, he was identifying these people, he called them elect, and he called them what else? Exiles. They were, they were outcasts. In, um, second, in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. So what I want you to understand is this. We, like Jesus said in, Matt, in, in John chapter 17, verse 16, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And folks, let me tell you something. You're never going to fix that. That's never going to get better. And I'm going to show you exactly what our status is in this world. Now, I want you to understand something. As we come to the Lord in faith and trust in him, we now become a citizen of another world that we've not even been to yet. The Bible says that we have an inheritance uh, laid up for us in heaven. And I told you a lot of that inheritance that we have is heaven itself. And now what happens is we become citizens of another world. And so our, our, our status in this world is we're like a foreigner. We're like an exile. The Bible also calls us a sojourner. We're just passing through. And you have to understand that as we process our lives in this world, there's always going to be that, you know, that weird thing that's going on where we feel different, where people look at us different. And, and we're going to look at some of these things as, as they... As they um, as they process, and, and we're going to see just exactly what our status is in just a minute. But let me just tell you what our relationship, remember what Jesus told his disciples? He said, the world hated me, and they're going to hate you. But you know what he didn't say? He didn't say, and you hate them back, <laughs> right? Don't let, them get, don't let them get one up on you, man. You go hate them back. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. And so what I want you to understand is as we process our faith in this world, we're a foreigner. We're a sojourner. We're in exile. And we have to understand that that's our role here. But let me share with you what we're not to do. Okay? As a foreigner, where we're living in a world that's not our home, and we have a home... And we'll experience that home someday. I want you to understand that our position is not adversarial. You say, well, that's right. And, uh, and I'm different and you, you need, you know, and, and I'm right and you're wrong. You're so wrong. And we get adversarial 
in our process. And folks, that's not what the Bible says. That's not at all what the Bible says. We're not here to make enemies. We're here to make disciples. <laughs> We're here to share the message. We're here to, to, to process in that way. Not to, you know, you're evil and you're wrong and I'm right. And, and we get in these debates and we get in all these, all these other kind of stuff. And folks, you know what I, I've come to in my life? I've come to a point in my life where I just don't debate. Because you can win the debate and lose the person. And what good did you do? You know, and I know there's some you know, folks that are kind of wired to be a right fighter. You know, they like to fight for what's right and what they think is right. And then they like to be declared, I'm right, you're wrong. Okay, good. Yeah. That got, that got nothing done. So as a foreigner, we're not here starting fights. We're not here to try to, you know, we're not here to argue with people. Not at all. Jesus told his disciples, he said, go out and, and, and spread the gospel. And when you come to some people, they're not going to listen to you. What you should do is just leave, go find somebody that will listen to you. And when you find somebody that listens to you, stay with them and, tell them and teach them and help them. That's how this works. He didn't say, go out there and fuss with them, fight with them. All right? So, as sojourners, we're not, we're not to be contentious, we're not to be adversarial, not to start fights. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to see people come to Christ. Secondly, as sojourners, we're not going to be adversarial, and sojourners, listen to me, we're not going to fix the system that we live in. Listen to me. Listen to me right now. Calm down. You're not going to fix this. And I don't care who you vote for and why you vote for them. And who, what, the folks, that's not, listen, you're not going to fix this with politics. You're not going to fix this with anything. And we're not here to fix it. We're here to share the gospel. We're here to minister and serve people. That's what, we're, that's what we are as sojourners. That's what we are as, um, as foreigners. We're not going to fix it. We don't need to worry about fixing it. You know, it's interesting how that when Jesus came, he talked about a kingdom. Well, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, but some of his followers thought that he was going to establish a kingdom on earth right then. And remember, they came to him and said, hey, when you get into your kingdom, can I be number one and my brother be number two? And, and can my, you know, my uh, cousin be the secretary of state and get, you know, and get everybody on the payroll here? Can, you, can we do that? And Jesus said, you don't understand. You don't understand what you're asking for. That's not the system. And remember when he ascended up in heaven, right before he ascended up, even his disciples came to him. He said, will you now restore the nation of Israel? What were they talking about? Will you now restore the nation of Israel and, 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 and get rid of the Roman tyranny and let us, let us do our thing? Jesus said, I didn't come to do that. I didn't come to fix the system. I came because I didn't come to condemn people. I came because people were already condemned. So I think it's important we understand that as sojourners, we're not going to uh, fix it. Uh, we're not going to, we don't need to oppose it. We're not going to fix it. And we don't need to endorse it. Amen. If it's broke, it's broke, friends. If it, it is what it is. And you say, well, it's, it, it, you know, this is good and that's, listen, it is what it is. And we need to understand that. So let me show you what we are. In the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter number 5, it talks about our ministry. And it talks about the, the ministry that we have is that we're reconciling people to God through Jesus Christ. And the, the whole concept of reconciling and moving um, Moving people together, the opportunity that we have to do that is only through Jesus Christ. So the Bible says this in verse number 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through to Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. 
He has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. That's what we are. You know what an ambassador is? It's an official from one country that goes to another country to serve them. Not fuss with them, but to serve them. And so what I'm telling you is this is how we're set apart. This is how we're holy. Is that we recognize and understand that we have a role to play, and it's not fight with them, it's not fix them, it's not endorse them, as an ambassador to minister, to share the gospel. Because, folks, we're not trying to fix this place because what we're trying to do is get folks ready to go to a better place. And that's how that works. I know that some of you may, when I start reciting this song, you, your foot will probably start tapping and you'll know this song because you come from the same place I did. But there's an old song that says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. One songwriter said this. He said, I'm kind of homesick for a country that I've never even been to before. <laughs> and I want you to understand, folks, we're made for eternity this life that we live is so brief. The Bible says this life that we live is like a puff of smoke, and just about the time you reach for it, it's gone. This life we live, the psalmist said, is like a tale that's been told, and it's just a story. You tell it, and then it has a beginning, and it has an end. But eternity is forever, and that's what we're made for. And sometimes we look for our reward here, most of that reward that we receive is going to be in, in eternity. And folks, can I tell you something? We're going to be together in eternity. You know one of the greatest gifts that you can give your family, your children, your friends, is the assurance of your faith in Christ to know that if something were to happen to you here, that they could see you again in heaven. The full and complete assurance. Folks, I'm going to tell you, that is a gift that you give to those that you love. And that gift is, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that said, we, um, we understand that holiness has to do with special use. And, and, and how that, got, that we've, been, um, we've been called to be ambassadors. And that's our special use. And that makes us different in, in a lot of ways. But difference fine. We can, we can deal with that. And then notice what else he says in this, um, in this passage of scripture as he refers here to... Um, how he referred, well, just listen. It says, the Bible says, and you know it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with precious blood, but with the precious blood of, of, of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So what we find here is he differentiates between um, two things. Number one, he says that which is perishable, silver and gold, or that which is precious, the blood of Jesus Christ. So what happens in our life is this. We get to choose between the, the, the perishable, the things that's not going to last, and the precious. And that's what God's done for us and the plans that God has for us. And so what I want you to understand in this, in this context is that the value that he places on this has to do with our accepting Christ as our Savior, realizing that that's the precious gift and the perishable is going to fade away. And folks, what I want you to know is that when, when you see things in the scriptures and when Jesus taught in the scriptures, what he taught us was this. There are things that are eternal. Those are the things that we need to pay attention to. And then there's things that are temporal, and those are the things that we don't need to, to get tangled up with. 
And when he's talking about silver and gold, he's just talking about money. And so what the scripture always does is it always warns us about our relationship with money. The Bible says you, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money. You're going to serve one of the two. And so you have to get the right relationship with money. The Bible says don't fall in love with money. So let me share with you what the Bible says about money. The Bible says that money is basically going to you're going to reveal two things in your life. Money is always a test or a tool. And in the context of this, what we find is that there's this pull and this power that we allow money to have in our life. And we find that that becomes a pursuit for us. And we be, kind of becomes a, a passion for us. And we, sometimes it overtakes us. And, and we get it all confused. And it causes a lot of confusion in our life, in our relationships, and in our relationship with God. And so what I want you to understand is this. Anytime there's a money conflict in your life, it's a test. It's a test. And the test is going to reveal what place that money has in your life. Now, the Bible talks about managing it. The Bible talks about being responsible with it. The Bible talks about even maximizing our capacity to, to, um, to, to earn it. Nothing wrong with that. But it has to be in that context. And in this passage of Scripture, the Bible says God did not redeem us with silver and gold but he, because it's perishable. But he did so. He redeemed us with the precious blood of Jesus. That's how he did it. That's where the priority is. And so what we have to do is get that priority. But let me just tell you this. Money's a tool. Money is a tool, and it's a tool by which we can use it to further the kingdom. We can use it to uh, and, and, and help someone else. We can use it, and the scripture has all of this information about, um, about what a great tool that, that money can be if it's used in the right way. The Bible says this. The Bible says if we give to the poor, we lend to the Lord in the book of Proverbs. Now, what that means is that's, that's a, the, the word lend there has a, a, a value to it to where it, it's, it's like a business transaction or it's like an investment. So as we give and help people, God sees it as an investment and God, we lend to the Lord. Well, what happens when you lend? You, you, you get it back. But you get it back in a, greater, in a greater volume than what you gave it. And so we see all these things that, 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 are, that are tools in our life. So if we manage it right, we work it right, we do it right, as God tells us to do it, God can bless us with that. So let me just share with the final thing with you, and that's the purity thing. And he goes on in this passage to talk about that. And um, he, he refers to, to the word of God, but listen to what he says. He says, now you've been pure, you, you purif purify yourself by obeying the truth. And I want to emphasize the truth here. So that you have a sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living, enduring word of God. All right? So remember when Jesus was teaching the disciples and he said, I'm the true vine and you're the branches? And he said that God prunes the branches so that it can produce more, more fruit? And then he said this, he said, you're already clean because of the word I spoke to you. There's a purifying element, friends, in the, in the scripture. There's a purifying element as I expose my life to the word of God, as you expose your life to the word of God. There's, a, there's a, a, a movement that the Bible has in our lives through the Holy Spirit that does something that we call convicting us. It kind of shows us ourself. And so we have this opportunity to experience this. And as it purifies us and, and works in us, and that's why we need to expose ourselves to the word of God in any way, in every way that we can. We need to read it. We need to hear it read. We need to hear it taught. We need to hear it in any way that we can. Sung, it doesn't matter. And then the Bible says that this word of God is a living, which means it's relevant, 
and enduring. And so as we look at this whole process, we look out and we see that because of our faith, we're different. That's not going to change. And as we do this, we understand that God calls us holy. And the Bible says we're holy in his sight. So if you go out today and you, you know, call up a couple of friends or you post on um, Facebook or something, like, hey, I just found out I'm holy. You may get a couple of comments on that. We are holy in God's sight. But it makes us different. It makes us different. We're different for our use. God says, listen, I need you to be an ambassador. I need you to be a foreigner in this land. Understand that you're just here for a purpose that you have here. You're not here to fight with people. You're not here with fix, to fix everything. You're certainly not here to endorse what's going on. This is not your home. And what we need to do, folks, is we don't need to try to fix the system. What we want to do is we want to share the gospel and get everybody ready to go to the next home. Because that's eternity. That's forever. And as we look at this thing, we understand that there's two, two ways to live. We could be pre preoccupied with the perishable, the things that are not going to be here, that's not going to matter. We got to get that right relationship with that with that money so it doesn't get a hold of us. And then we need to understand that in this life we have to be purified. Because we're going to get soiled and we're going to get set back and that word of the word of God will do that in our life. It'll minister to us. It'll purify us. The Bible says it's living, it's relevant, and it's enduring. And so as we process these things, and as we look around us, we think, you know what? I'm an ambassador. I'm not from here, but I'm supposed to be here to do what God wants me to do. And I'm not buying into everything that, that's here, and I'm not going to try to fix everything that's here. And, and I can tell you, folks, there's ways that people are trying to fix things, and it's just it's not going to fix. And we don't need to focus on that. We don't need to try to fix this kingdom. We need to build God's kingdom, right? And, uh, and look forward to that. So as we think about that, as we process that in our lives today, that's why we're different. That's why there's always going to be a little difference there. And when people talk about what's going to fix this and how everybody's got a different idea, Folks, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do what we've been called to do, but we're going to leave this place behind someday. <laughs> All right? And what we want to do is take everybody with us we can by sharing the gospel and doing the kingdom work for God's honor and glory. Father God, I thank you for your word. I ask you, God, that you would just encourage the hearts of every person here that as we live and function in this life, that we could consider ourselves ambassadors. We could see ourselves as foreigners. That, Lord, we would just be able to respond to the things around us and share and care and minister to those people, but realize, God, this isn't our home. This isn't eternal. Lord, you said that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will endure forever. So, God, with the plans that you have for us for eternity... I ask you, God, that you would just put that in our hearts and allow that, God, to be an expression of hope. Because when we sometimes look around us, God, and we, we see the things that are taking place and we sometimes don't understand them, sometimes they fill us with fear, I pray that our hearts would be filled with hope to know that this is just one stop on the journey. And that, Lord, as we make this journey, and we, when we someday um, come to the place where you are and in your presence, that we'd bring everybody we can with us by sharing the gospel with them. So I just pray that you would encourage our hearts, bless in every way. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.